Um, Guys, we are in this sermon series, Redefining Existence, Um, and this is coming from the book of Ephesians, this letter that was written by Paul, Um, and he really summarizes it this way, that the apocalypse of Jesus has the potential to redefine our existence. And so uh, so we, we said this whole time, like, right, apocalypse, it doesn't mean what we you know, think it means, it's not doom in the end, it means to uncover something that was previously hidden. So the revelation about Jesus has the potential to redefine what you think about life, what you think about relationships, the whole, the whole, the whole nine yards. Um, and so, so what's been happening in chapters one, two, and three of Ephesians, it's been Paul telling the story. He's been retelling the story with Jesus at the center. And so we get these broad sweeping why questions. Why is it that Jesus has the potential to redefine your existence? Why not Karen? Karen, why doesn't Karen get to redefine that? Why not Craig? Why didn't Craig get to redefine your existence? Why is it Jesus? And so when we get to chapters four, five, and six, now we're in the the what. Now we're in the how. In other words, if this is true, if, if Jesus is who he says he is, what are the implications? How am I supposed to now live? And so for the rest of the, this, this, uh, this series, when we come in on a Sunday, what we're going to find now is that God is shifting and he's going to begin to tell you, here's how I want you to live. This is what I want you to do. Uh, and it's going to look very different from everyone else around you, and that should not freak you out because I already told you that this entire thing is through a revelation, right? It's, it's, in in other words, everybody doesn't think and feel the same way about Jesus than you do if you're a Jesus follower. And, and that's, that's fine. It's okay, which means everybody doesn't have the, the same motives and intentions to live out this way. And that's good and that's fine, but we at least need to find out today what, what is it that's so important about living a different life? What's, what's that all about? And so that's what we're going to, going to do. So let's, let's pray. Um, God Almighty, I just thank you so much for time today. Um, I'm asking God that you would show up. Uh, you take uh, this uh, inability to communicate super effectively, and you, you, would, you would do whatever it is you want to do um, with it, God, that you would say what you want to say to us, and let us be transformed in our hearts and minds, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's go Ephesians chapter 4. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pick up where we left off from last week. Verse 17, if you have a Bible, if you don't have one, it'll be, you can follow along uh, behind me. This is Paul writing. He says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, Live no longer as the Gentiles do. Remember, in this time, there's Jewish people and then there's Gentiles. There's the rest of humanity, right? That's, this is how they see it. So Paul just said, live no longer like the rest of humanity. That's interesting. Uh, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their heart against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. That, that isn't what you learned about Christ. That word means Messiah. Uh, since you have heard about Jesus, the Messiah, and you have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by its lusts and deceptions. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on uh, your new nature. Watch this. Created to be like God. Truly Uh, righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth for we are part of the same body and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you're a thief, quit stealing stuff. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words uh, will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring, excuse me, sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Jesus, this Messiah, has forgiven you. This is the reading of God's word. Um, the sermon title for today is, hey, you better stop doing that. I'm just kidding. It's not the sermon title. Um, sermon title today is Mirror, Mirror. Mirror, Mirror. You might find yourself wanting to like complete that sentence like mirror, mirror on the wall, that kind of thing, snow white kind of thing. It's not quite where we're going, but kind of. Uh, today is, uh, it's all about a story. Um, it will be all about a story. And um, 
Stories are cool because story, for stories, like, context is king. Like, you can change the intention of what was said or done based on the context, right? Depends on, like, who's talking and who's receiving and, and what they have on and what time of day it is and, and what was the voice inflection like when they said the thing because it might change the meaning. Um, and the cool thing about stories is if you somehow miss the beginning of the story or you misunderstand the beginning of the story, well, the rest of it's really, really hard to understand. So you might enjoy the movie, but you really don't get why, you know, they had to go up into the space and do the whole thing, right? Something like that. So today I'm just going to do what Paul did. We just said that Paul just retold the story with Jesus at the center. And that's all I'm going to do is just retell the Old Testament story with Jesus at the center so that we can understand why he's now saying, do this, don't do this. Because I don't know about you, but if you've been tracking with us week after week, uh, Paul, in, his energy has, has shifted. Like he goes from like in chapters one, two, and three, my man Paul is like Buddy the Elf. Everything is great. He's like, it's Jesus and grace and you don't have to behave your way to the kingdom and he's got a new family for you and God's going to send you on mission and you're going to save the world. Like that's, that's all Paul in chapters one through three. And now all of a sudden, Paul is like, he's talking bad about people who don't follow Jesus. He's like, man, they're wicked and evil and full of lust and deceit and they're corrupt. And you're like, it's kind of harsh, Paul. And even if you're here and you're not a Jesus follower, you're like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of slightly offended. Or you really are offended. Or if, if, even if you're a Christian in here, you're like, well, I, I was I once was not a Christian, so I'm kind of offended by what you're saying about, what I, about my life, Paul. And, and then he's doing this thing where it kind of sounds like he's threatening you. Like, hey, do this and don't do this and do this and don't do this. Well, 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 what in the world is going on? In other words, in other words, I say it like this. If the Christian faith is predicated on the fact that you don't have to behave your way to Jesus, then as a Jesus follower, how are you supposed to now hear commands? How, how are you supposed to understand do this, don't do this? Because I, I kind of thought that we were uh, away from that, Paul. What, what's going on? Well, in order to understand, that means we got we to gotta go back to the beginning. So... It's story time. We ready? You don't sound very ready. Uh, I got the microphone, so you can't help it. You got to sit along and just enjoy the ride, okay? Um, so when, when, we, when, we, when we see God's relationship with humans and Genesis, this is all about a mirror. The plot is a mirror. It's an image. It's a reflection. In other words, once God finish, he finish makes, he, he makes his, his beautiful world, he wants to see his image reflected back to him. He wants to make a creature and a, a being that's able to do for the world what he can do for the world, which is to take care of it, to cause it to flourish, so on and, and, and so forth. And so, so in order for God's world to, uh, world to flourish, he does an interesting thing. Day one, two, three, four, five, what we see God doing in order that people might enjoy his good world, God separates. You ever, you ever, you ever, you ever read Genesis chapter one and you're like, but why did you have to separate it? Why didn't you just already make it separate? In other words, you, you separated the light from the dark. Well, that's, that makes some sense, right? If the world is completely dark and you can't see, well, you cannot enjoy whatever he wants to put on the earth. And, and if he does not separate the water from the land, well, that makes sense because if, if the, if the water is covering up all the other cool stuff, then you can enjoy it. And probably you're much more like a mermaid kind of fish hybrid thing. You're not actually a human. If the whole world was water, sorry, that's just my, my crazy brain. Um, uh, so God makes these separations day one, two, three, four, five, six. And when, when we get to day six, he says, I know all of this is creation, but what I'm about to do is I'm about to create, uh, I'm about to separate and make this thing distinct from all other creation creation. And so let, let's, let's read that so we can, we can, we can kind of get the story. Um, he says this, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Are you seeing the mirror? Uh, they will reign over the fish of the sea, birds in the sky, livestock, all the animals. 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I want to see a, a mirror. And then he said, I, I bless them. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, govern over it, reign over it. In other words, as we already said, when I, when I created the world, I want to see my image looking back at me. But the real question is, well, why is that important? When God makes this separation and distinction, he separates people and says, you are my image bearers. Now, now here's the cool thing that you got to know about you. The cool thing that you got to know about you being created is God made who you are and what you do, and he tied them together because it will uniquely reflect who he is. 
In other words, if we look at the beginning of the story and if we don't quite understand or get this wrong, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be way off. So why is it important that he makes image bearers? An image bearer is, a, is someone who's reflecting him. In order to reflect God's image, it means you're reflecting his goodness, his character, his love. Why is that important to God? Well, because he decided, not us, but he decided, listen, if, if not, then people will never get to experience who I am. They will not get to experience the good world that I made for them without an image bearer. I need someone who, with, with their family, with everything that they produce, everything that they say, uh, everything that they create, all of the art, all of the music, all of the entertainment, all of the law, all of the whatever, the politics, I need it to be a reflection of me or else you, you, you won't get to experience me or the good world I designed because who you are and, and what you do, man, they're uniquely tied to this mirroring of me. This is super important that we get this or else we really don't stand a chance of understanding really much of the Bible and we certainly won't understand what Paul is saying. I need you to uniquely be this. When I set you apart and I make you distinct this way, um, I, I, I'm not doing a thing where I'm like going like this to you. I'm telling you it's because you're my image bearer and I want you to look like me. And so, so, so what we see is this really, really interesting pattern that emerges right from the very, very beginning. And so if we're, if we're going like, like, like telling a story, this is like act one, act one would be scene one is like the, like the garden. And God says this, this pattern is going to happen over and over again. I'm going to separate people, making them image bearers. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give them my covenant. And then after giving them a covenant, I'm going to give them some commands. And then what's, what's interesting that always happens in the Bible is then the human people, they end up failing to bear my image. And so, so what, I, what you need to understand for today, for sure, for sure, is that, is that covenants always come before uh, 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 commands. In, o- in other words, God always acts this way. He always says, listen, I'm with you. I- I- I'll never leave you. I- I'm going to bless you. I will protect you. I'll do for you. I- I'm, for, I'm for you. I- I'll be faithful to you. I- I'll provide for you. All of that comes first. And, and-, and then God says, so, so, so here's some commands. And-, and every time we hear commands, instead of us thinking that God is doing this, much more what God is saying is like, no, I'm just asking you to look like me because who you are and what you do are uniquely tied so that so that you can know me and then you can make me known to people. So I'm not wagging my finger as much as I'm saying, no, this is just who you are. This is just how you would behave. This is how I want my image to be reflected in the world. And it just keeps just keeps happening where he separates, he makes image bearers, he gives us his covenant, then he gives us commands, and then we fail to bear the image. And so where does that happen? Well, that happens pretty soon in Genesis chapter three in this first act of things, right? Genesis chapter three happens and sort of kind of like Snow White, what ends up happening is the enemy reveals himself because the enemy is disguising himself to deceive a human through poison fruit. And we see that through story the Snow White, and we see that through 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 the Bible. That that here comes this guy who's like deceiving the world, and, and as soon as as soon as we take the bait, humans take the bait. These image bearers. Well, well, what happens now is the image of God is now it's like like marred. It's like it's like um. It's like twisted and tainted. It's not pure anymore. It's almost like we've been turned in on ourselves. And now these image bearers who are supposed to take his goodness, character, and love, now we have a problem. And that problem is now, now we doubt God's goodness and we, we doubt his character. We doubt his love. And so we got a problem because as the image bearers go, well, then so, so goes the world too, right? It's just the way it's supposed to be. It's the way he, it's the way he set it up. Um, um, so, so here's this problem. We've turned in on ourselves. Um, and, uh, and, and, and if we're honest with ourselves, what does it look like not, not to bear the image of God? If we're, if we're honest with ourselves real quick, we'll, we'll agree. We can agree. And I'll just speak for you on your behalf, if you don't mind, um, that, that, hey, Derek, if you're telling me that I'm supposed to reflect his goodness, character, and love, then can you please answer the question, then why does it seem so right not to bear his image? In other words, when someone injures me with their words, when they say, when they say something unkind to me, why does it seem right and why does it kind of feel good, if I'm honest, to clap back at them? I, I, I'm not actually thinking in that moment about bearing his image. I'm thinking about getting even. And that feels really good and it feels really right to me. 
right? Uh, so, 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 so in other words, like, because I'm doubting who God, who God is, uh, I, I'm much more like Adam and Eve when, they, when they're just like, but, but, but are, you, are, you, are you really good? Do you really, really uh, uh, love me? So, 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 if, um, so say, for instance, uh, when you get angry and you want to fight somebody, I, I, I'll speak for you because you don't have a microphone, but you, you, ever, you ever get angry and you're ready to like, like slap somebody in the mouth and there's this surge of energy that rushes through your body? Anybody feel, I'm not alone? Okay, 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 okay. For you honest people, raise your hand. Don't that feel good to your body? Some feel good. you like, whoo! Uh, 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 but, but Derek, you're telling me that I'm supposed to reflect this. I'm not thinking about that in, in the moment. There's something that feels good about not bearing the character of God in that moment. And Derek, like, can you tell me, like, I wouldn't necessarily say this out loud, but since it's just me and you in the room, like, I got this thing about power that feels really intoxicating because what I'm doing with my friends, and they don't really know I'm doing it, is that, um, is that I, 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 I say some things to my friends, that one friend, and, and then I say something kind of opposite and sneaky to the other friend, and before you know it, they're kind of going at each other, and then I get to be like the rescuer. I know nobody else in here does that, or you, 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 you don't know anybody like that, but, but, but can you tell me why that power, it feels good. So if this is what I'm supposed to do, help me understand that like, like, like it, sin feels good. And it seems right. And if we're honest with ourselves, it seems good and feels good only for a moment. And then you're like, I got to deal with the consequences. What, what's going on in us? Well, Paul already told us, told us in Ephesians chapter 4, if we pull that back up, verse 17 through 19, he says, I'm telling you, you cannot live like everybody else now. He says they're hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life of God, uh, uh, and, and they've closed their minds. They've hardened their hearts against him. Again, they this, that. They t- they've been twisted in on, the, on themselves. So they really, they, they're questioning whether or not they should really be bearing the image because I don't, I don't know if you're, you can keep that up. I don't know if you're really good. Like, 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 like if I'm sitting in the hospital room waiting for my friend and I'm in the emergency room, what's going through my mind is I'm not quite sure that God, you're going to use that power to like do something for my friend. And, 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 and sometimes when I, when I go to the, when I go to the, uh, uh, to the mailbox and I, and I get that white envelope and I, I cut it open and my mind, my eyes immediately go to that top corner where I see the amount due and I take a gasp of breath because I, I don't have the amount due. And so, so now I'm wondering, God, are, are, you, are you really good that this is what's happening? This is what's happening. And he says, they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and practice every kind of impurity. Listen to what he says when we drop down 22. So, so he says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust. It feels good. And deception. Listen, listen, there are a lot of people in your life that you probably come to expect. They're probably going to be dishonest with you, lie to you, manipulate you. You've just, as a human, you've got enough experience to know that's that's just going to happen. But there is one person in your life that you do not expect to do that to you. Hey, you. The one person that you think would never, ever lead you down a path that's not the best for you. Why would you do that to yourself? You would never, ever lie to you. Right, right. Because when the person injures you and you want to clap back, you can't convince me that, that in that moment, you, you don't feel deceived. You're like, no, the right thing to do is to injure them back. That's the right thing to do. That's how you feel. Like, you don't think that you're li- somehow lying to yourself. You see, Paul would say. So in other words, Paul is like, no, 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 no. I'm not mad at people who don't follow Jesus. I'm not dogging them. I'm just telling you what it's like when we don't bear the image. I'm just showing you what it's like because we've been twisted in on ourselves. And now we, 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 we don't think God is really good. So am I really going to do his whole like image bearing thing? I, I, don't, I don't know now. But Paul says, see, this is, this is our plight. So as image bearers go, so, so the world's going to go. And there's a lot of people who, including myself, I can tell you generation after generation, we are not the only generation that has said, how can you sit there in this church and lift your hands? to some good God, and you see all this stuff that's happening in the world, what is wrong with y'all? What Kool-Aid are you possibly drinking? Do you see all the problems? And see, the biblical authors would say, hmm, no, 
as image bearers go, so the world goes. Because the way God designed it is, who you are and what you do and how you live, it's uniquely tied to reflecting him. And so if, if this is off, everything else is, is going to be off. He, he kind of said, it's your fault. It's, it's your fault. Uh. The problem is that, well, well we, we doubt the goodness and the love of God. But this pattern, there's something about this pattern that lets us know, oh, I don't know if I have really good reason to think that he's not good. Because every single time, if we go back to scene one, remember, he separates. He says, here's humanity, and then I need to make a distinction between man and woman. Because, because uniquely, you guys will bear my image, and people, you get to be in relationship with me, and people get to enjoy what it's like to be with me through you. So, 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 so the next thing he does is, I'm going to give you this covenant. I'm going to tell you, you, you man, you're, I'm going to bless your socks off, man. Man, man, you guys are going to create some cool stuff, man. You get to rule and reign with, with, with me. It's going it's to be awesome. I'll, I'll always be here with you. This is going to be great. And then then comes the command that says, hey, don't, just don't, don't take that. Don't, don't take wisdom for yourself. Don't reach out and say, I think I, I think I know better. No, just come, just come back into a relationship and ask me, and then I'll, then I'll help you. Don't do that for yourself. So then we fail to bear the, fail the better image. And so then God says, okay, well, what do I do? Well, in my goodness, I'm just going to, I'm just going to start over again with a separation, a covenant, a command, and I'm going to watch you guys like, like fail to bear my image. So, so what's scene two? Scene two in the Bible is Israel and the rest of the nations. In other words, it's Israel, the, the, the nation of Israel, uh, you know, the song, Father Abraham had many sons and many sons said, Father Abraham, like it, it starts with Abraham, this guy named Abraham. And so what's the pattern? We, we see God saying, here's all the nations, but I'm going to make a separation. I'm going to make a distinction between Abraham and everyone else. It, it, it's not that I don't care about everyone else, but Abraham, you, you are mine. And so what's the next thing that God should do? It should be a there you go. We're going to get there. Uh, God's going to make a covenant, right? What, what's the covenant? The covenant is, hey, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Whoever blesses you, I'll bless. If somebody harms you, like, like I'll pay them back. You don't have to worry about that. Like your descendants, the, the, this nation is going to be larger than, than, the, than the stars in the sky. And, and, he says, and then I'm going to bring the, this deliverer, this Messiah. I'm going to bring them through your family line. I'm promising you, Abraham, I'll always be with you. I'll always protect you. I'll always guide. And then hundreds of years later, then comes the Ten Commandments. And if you were like me growing up around this stuff, whether you have a semblance of, of religion or not, somehow we always got it in our minds that these Ten Commandments are a moral contract in which God is saying, if you do this, then you get me. If you don't follow these Ten Rules, then you do not get me. And what we're now saying is, oops, we had the wrong idea the entire time. Why do we know that? Because it's always been his covenant. You, 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 you belong to me. Like, 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 think about the story. You belong to me. I come and get you out of slavery because you are mine. Why would I protect you? Because I already told you that that's what I would do for you. Would it make sense to you now that God says, now that you are mine and you belong to me, let me make these rules so that you can come get me? Thank you. Like, <laughs> Yes, God, that, that makes so. We planned that, right? We planned that. I swear to you. I swear to you. I'm like, Lavana, you cannot miss this time. You cannot miss this. It's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Special effects brought to you by Lavana. Oh. No, no, God, that never made any sense. I would never expect you to then make some moral rules. That would, that would get you, that would get me to you if, if, if you already came and got me. It's not like you're playing hide and seek, like, aha, like, I'll be back. Like, I'll only come to you if you, if you obey. If not, then I'm going I'm to I'm stay over here. I'm going to take all the things I promised in that covenant. I'm taking them away because you, 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 you won't do the things. No, 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 no. Remember, he gives a covenant. And then the commands were always meant to be seen this way. I'm telling you who you are. 
I'm telling you what it's like to bear my image. I'm telling you that this is what it means to know me and make me known. It was never about you do this or else. It was always, even the Ten Commandments, it was always, no, 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 bear my, look like me in the earth because people will get to enjoy me and enjoy the good world I created if you, if you do that. And then what does Israel do? Well, we, 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 we fail to bear God's image. Like, don't, don't we understand this in, in our natural world, this, this idea that, that, that covenants come before commands? We get it. Like, none of y'all are, like, thinking I'm a really bad guy because I've got kids and I choose to, to, to like, house my kids. And then you're not like, well, you're such a bad dude because why don't you put, like, more kids in your house? Like, you, you're, you don't really love kids because you won't put them in your house. Well, well, think about it for a second. There has been a separation. These kids are uniquely mine. They bear me in Beth's image because I'm going to tell them, hey, this is what it means to be in this family. So I'm going to give you some commands, but I'm, I'm already in, in covenant with you. Would I ever leave my children because sometimes, most of the time, they don't look like what I asked them to look like? I would never do that. So why do you? Why do you? Maybe it's, maybe it's because you, 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 me and you, it's hard for us to really understand the intentions of the Father. You, when I talk about my kids, you get it. Oh, yeah, your intentions for your kids are really, really good. They don't have to behave for you in order for you to love them. Maybe what's going on with us is we just, we don't really get the intention of, of, our, of, our, of our Father. We understand this also in like marriage agreements. Like you come skipping down the aisle because you found your, your Boonopolis finally, right? And you're so happy. And, and what do you do at the, at the head of the church? Well, you, you make a covenant. And then, then, the, then the command is, yeah, I'll, I'll, only, I'll only be with you. Like you get married, you're not at the bachelor party like, yo, dude, uh, it's rough, man. She like actually expects you. You know she actually expects you to be faithful to her, right? Like, or how, he, he think that, he think that, you, like, you're just supposed to be faithful to him only? How dare he? Yeah, nobody, nobody ever, ever bats an eye at that. Nobody. It, it certainly is a command, but that doesn't feel like a command, does it? No, 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 because, see, you and I, we never mind limits when it's coupled with love. We never mind which means what must be happening in us, this twistedness in us, makes us really not understand the intentions of, the, of, of, our, of our God. And when, when God puts, no, actually when you, you, you're the one who put that limit on your marriage, it's funny how when you put that limit and that boundary and that separation on your marriage, it's funny how that limit and that boundary is the very thing that makes your marriage flourish. It's almost kind of like you're an image bearer, and, and that story is in you because at the beginning, like we said, when God started making stuff, he had to put limits and boundaries so that the world could actually flourish. And so while we're looking at what we think are limitations and standards and boundaries that God is placing on us, he says, no, this is actually the thing that's meant to help you grow the most. So when you have to, when you have to commit to one woman, one husband, and you close that door behind you, what's going to happen in you is you're going to flourish and, and grow. If you don't ever do that, this is not a prerequisite to like everybody's got to be married. I'm just giving an example. Don't think that engaged like everybody's got to be married. No, I'm just saying it, but if you don't do that, guess what? And you don't take responsibility, then you don't get to really grow up until you shut the door and it's, it's you and her and, and you and him. It's, going, it's what's going to cause it to flourish because you made the separation. You made the distinction. We look at God and say, that's all you're really doing. Scene two, separation, image bearers. I gave you my covenant first before the commands and then just like normal, the image bearers in Israel, they failed to bear my image. So, scene three. Did you know in all the Bible, God only made three separations? Only three. Only three. And the last one is Jesus and this new creation that Paul has been talking about in Ephesians. Because just like Snow White, 
we can't live happily ever after until Prince Charming comes and awakens us to, to, to what's actually going on, what's, what's reality really about. So he says there's new creation and old creation, and that's the reason I'm telling you in verse 17, hey, you can't live like everybody else. You can't live like the rest of the humans because it no longer makes sense. Well, well then, then, then somebody, uh, uh, so, so once God makes the distinction and a separation, what's the next thing that comes? Mm-hmm. Say it louder. Covenant. It's a, it's, it's, I'm, t- I'm just telling you it's a pattern about. He makes a distinction. There's covenant. What's, what's this covenant all about? Well, it's, it's written in my own blood, Jesus would say. It's given with my own body. This is completely irrevocable. When I tell you I'm with you and I'm for you and I'm going to protect you and I'm going to guide you and I'm going I'm to let me take the reins and I'm going to be faithful to you, I mean it. It cannot be revoked. And some of us in here, you're st- including myself, I'm still thinking, well, what's my part in it? No, sit down. <laughs> no, none. My faithfulness to you has nothing to do with covenant. And, and now, 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 and in, in this chapter now, he says, I'm going to give you some commands. Why commands? I'm, I'm just trying to tell you what it's like to bear my image. I'm, j- I'm never telling you to do this or else. I'm telling you, I just want you to look like me. If the problem is that, that, that image bearers, we doubt the goodness of God, the love of God, then the solution is that the revelation of Jesus, the apocalypse of Jesus, it actually restores image bearers and our trust in God. Because the entire time where we're thinking, maybe you're not as good as you say you are, when we look at this pattern that he keeps doing, we must say, no, it is you. You are the one who has been intentional in this relationship to keep a covenant with me, even when I didn't want the covenant with you so that I could be an image bearer. You are really stinking good. Because if it was me, I would have been out a long time ago. Me and you don't have that, that level of patience and, and, and faithfulness to stick it out with somebody who's like clearly not for, you're not for me, you're not for me. Okay, but, but, but God is saying, I've always shown my goodnesses. I will make covenant after covenant if it means you, 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 you will bear my image. If it means you'll allow me to be who I am in your life, I'll, I'll just keep going. And so, so it's new creation and old creation. And so, so, so now it makes total sense why Paul would say, hey, so, so don't, don't lie to people no more. Now it makes perfect sense. But if I don't read it before, if I read it any other way, I'm going to hear, don't you lie to people. When really what he's saying is, you know, you understand, I'm giving you my covenant to keep you long enough so the spirit of God can transform you. So what I'm asking you is not, why you lie to that person? I'm asking you, hey, why did you lie to, why did you lie to your husband that time? I'm curious, why, why are you being manipulative in your relationships? But why? If we go a little bit deeper, like, why, why, like what, what are you afraid of? Who are you trying to be saved from? That's what lies are. That's what lies do for us. So God would just say, hey, 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 even if you got to tell the truth, just know I'm a, I, I got your back. It might be a little hard, but I got you. See, the covenant is there to, to, to keep us long enough so the, so the spirit of God can actually do the work and transform us. But we got to do the work and say, huh, yeah, that's a good question, God. Like, like, like my, um, if, I'm, if I steal stuff, he's like, why, why? But why? Don't, don't, you, don't you think I'm going to provide for you? You don't, you don't have to take anything. I, I got you. But your heart is, my heart is still like, like Adam and Eve's like, but God, will you give me what I think I need when I think I need it, though? So I got I to gotta, I gotta take this. He says, no, you don't have to do that anymore. I got you. He said, why are you so, why are you angry? Don't, like, put away, the, put away the bitterness in your heart. You don't have to do that anymore. You can, you, can, you can actually be kind because you belong to me. You don't have to repay anybody anything. Don't, don't you, I, I, I'll, I'll be the protector of your, of, your, of your heart. I'll do that for you. In other words, listen, man, he's not, he's not asking you this morning 
to get a case of the do better. Got to do it right. He's asking him more, I just want you to, I want you to look like me. Because that former life no longer makes any sense. If, remember, chapters 1, 2, and 3 are the why. If the why is true, then you live in this old manner. It doesn't make sense. By faith, you are saying there is a whole new life to be lived. And now I get to understand what it's like to be in relationship with you. And now I understand what it's like to actually show that to, to, to other people. So today, none of this was meant to be like an exhaustive list of all the things that could be, could be places where you're not bearing his image. And so I'll let the Holy Spirit do his work in you and just simply ask you, where is he just asking you, hey, hey, I want you to look like me right here. Not, not get it right. I just want you to look like me right here. Where is that for you? And, and if, 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 if we're Jesus followers, man, we got to be honest and say, well, there's at least a place. Like, I don't, I don't just look like you in every area. There's, there's something. Why don't you let God just for a moment just, where is that? Did you know, did you know what's interesting thing about mirrors? Mirrors only reflect the thing that it's pointed at. What do you, what is your mirror pointed at? In, in other words, every single day of our lives, we're being shaped by things. Don't ever think that you were not. We're going to be shaped by something. So God might be saying, yep, yeah, see, you're, you're looking at doing life this way for, for your own reasons. You, you think when you, when you look on social media or, or, or when you look at other people and you compare yourself to other people, you're, you're staring at something. And, and, and I want you much more to just stare, you know, uh, you know back at me so, so that you can reflect and you can, you can figure out, like, what, what I'm trying to say is I want you to look like, I want you to look like this, not, not that. Is it because we're trying to look, are we, is it because Christians are just flat out better than all non-Christians? That's ridiculous. no. He's saying, but you, you belong to me. Would you, would you trust, trust my heart for you so that you, so that you, so that you can actually be transformed? Where is that for you? I want to pray. I just want to pray and just see if anybody would like to come into agreement with that. Like, yeah, man, I got an area. Because God's not going to be like cruel and be like pointing all this stuff like this, 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 this. No, he's just, hey, man, what's. What's, what's the thing? Let's pray. God, I just, let's thank you for this moment we get. God, I'm actually praying that we would feel so much liberation. Understanding that these do's or don'ts are much more who we are meant to be and what, what it looks like to actually reflect, reflect you. And God, there, there are, we, we gladly submit, we gladly say, yeah, I, got, I can think of one or two things in my life where it doesn't, I don't look like you here. And I, I, need, I need more time. I, I, I'm so glad you gave me this covenant to keep me so that the Spirit of God inwardly, we, we could get transformed. If that's you, can I just, I just want to pray with you that you were saying, here's an area of my life I don't look like Jesus in, and I want to rely on God's Spirit to help me. Is there anybody in the room? Show your hands. Yeah. All over. I see you. God bless all of you. I see you. Anybody else you just want to say, yeah, that's where I'm at. Well, Father, I, I do. I pray for my, myself and everybody with their hands raised. God, you, you knew it before we got here. Um, and and, and, and I, I pray that the Spirit, truly the Spirit of the Father would be here in this moment so that we can much more hear your voice asking us, beckoning us to be with you first. Not, not to change first. Everybody with their hands lifted, I'm here to let you know he's not asking you to change first without relationship with him. He understands and knows it's going to take his spirit in you to transform you. And so, God, we gladly say, Lord, would you, this area, would you begin to transform me? I'm, I'm praying that in this area, it wouldn't just be a one and done, like, yeah, I prayed that prayer, and so now I'm good. No, no, God, I'm praying for all of us in the room with our hands lifted up and in agreement with you that, no, man, I would have, we would ask the deeper whys, what, what's really going on? What am I hanging on to? What, what do I feel and sense is the thing that's really, really being my Savior in this moment? And I'm asking, God, that you would reveal that to us. We, we, we would truly relinquish our, our, other, our other Saviors for the best would you do that in us, through us, in family? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.